but they're part of it, and they get the junkets, and they get you know they the more you know the more uh, Boniva you sell, you know the more tickets you know the more Pfizer drugs you sell, because uh, I do know a Pfizer sales rep. Uh, the more perks you get from Pfizer, dinners, tickets to concerts, tickets to sporting events, tickets really if you're really doing well, send you on a cruise. Yeah. So, like everything else, it's a business. So this overusage in Europe is uh, becoming a real problem. Uh, pneumonia has doubled. Uh, the account of resistant pneumonia has doubled from 7 to 15 percent. And that's worrying because these type of uh, last of the line antibiotics uh, treat, uh, they're the, pretty much the last of the line. If you've, everything else wouldn't work, uh, you're in trouble. And I think that we have a lot to worry about with this. This is the bio plague I'm worried about. Something to do with uh, an, anti anti an antibiotic resistant bio plague. You know, whether it be, uh, well, of course it would be man made. <laughs> what else would it be? What else would it be, ladies and gentlemen? If, God forbid, everything like that ever happens, you know, like the flu epidemic, 1918, people start dropping like that. I tell you, it, I, I, you know, I couldn't prove it because you, you'd have to look further. But if, if that is something that happens, and you couldn't prove it immediately, but rest assured, these elite are behind it, and they're the ones that have the cure. So if we start dropping like flies, ladies and gentlemen, it's not an accident, and it's not Armageddon, and it's not God's wrath. And it's not any terrorists, although they are the terrorists. These elite families are the terrorists. Uh, these controllers. Who look at us as scum, as useless eaters. Like Henry Cain, uh, Herman Cain, want, trying to get information from, from uh, Henry Kissinger, one of the most horrific war criminals, literally on, he is a war criminal, and they prop him up on the media like he's... He's God's gift to foreign policy, uh, a, a literal genocidal maniac, an insane, you know, psychopath, who is one of those like hit, like Hitchcockian type sac. You know, we are successful. Hitchcockian type psychopaths. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. We are Change with host Howard Nima, exposing the collectivist global elite's Malthusian quest for a new world order. A one-world dictatorial government where all aspects of human life are under their control. Truth Talk Radio. Where news the mainstream media ignores is the top story and your voice is heard. We are change. Fridays from 1 to 3 p.m. and Saturdays from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hosted by Howard Nima. Only on informedradio.com. That's N F O R M D radio.com. Tune in, call in. We must be the change we wish to see in the world. We are change with Howard Nima. Every Friday, 1 to 3 p.m., and every Saturday, 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Only on nformdradio.com. That's We Are Change with Howard Nima. Fridays, 1 to 3 p.m., and Saturdays, 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Only on N formed radio, 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 only on N formed radio.
radio only dot n formed radio only dot n formed radio only dot n formed radio during the republican national convention in 1880 a compromise was struck to nominate former minister and elder for the Church of Christ, James A. Garfield of the party's half-breed faction. Chester A. Arthur, former collector for the Port of New York, was chosen to be Garfield's running mate to satisfy the Stallworths faction. Senator Roscoe Conkling, who had mentored Chester A. Arthur since the late 1860s and had granted him a $10,000 a year tax commission post, not consulted by Garfield about the appointment of William H. Robertson, as a collector of the Port of New York. Conkling, along with fellow New York State Senator Thomas C. Platt, resigned. Conkling tried to force the Republican majority of the New York State Legislature to re-elect him, affirming his status as the New York Republican leader, but was successfully blocked by the half-breed faction. And Conkling's congressional career ended. The squabble consumed the Garfield presidency overshadowing promising activities such as Postmaster General James' investigation of the Star Root postal frauds and Secretary of Treasury William Wyndham's successful refinancing of the federal debt. On June 19, 1881, President James A. Garfield stated to Congress, whoever controls the volume of money in our country is absolute master of all industry and commerce. And when you realize that the entire system is very easily controlled one way or another by a few powerful men at the top, you will not have to be told how periods of inflation and depression originate. On July 2nd, 1881, at 9.30 a.m., at the 6th Street Railroad Station in Washington, D.C., President James A. Garfield was shot by Charles J. Guiteau, a failed lawyer and bill collector. Guiteau was a member of the utopian religious sect known as the Oneida Community, founded by John Humphrey Noyes in Oneida, New York, in 1848. The community believed in perfectionism, that Jesus Christ had already returned in the year 70, making it possible for them to bring about Christ's kingdom themselves and be free of sin and perfect in this world, not just heaven. They shared property and possessions and had unorthodox sexual practices. Guiteau never fit in. He left the group after five years and obtained his law license in Chicago. Soon his interest turned to politics. He wrote a speech called Grant versus Hancock, which he revised to Garfield versus Hancock after Garfield won the Republican presidential nomination in 1880. Ultimately, he changed little more than the title and replaced Grant's achievements with Garfield's. The speech was delivered twice, and copies were passed out to members at the Republican National Committee at their 1880 meeting in New York. After the election, Guiteau believed himself to be largely responsible for Garfield's victory. He insisted, as reward for his vital assistance, he should be granted an ambassadorship. His requests to the president and cabinet members were continually rejected. On May 14, 1881, he was finally told personally by Secretary of State James G. Blaine never to return. Soon after, Guiteau decided that God had commanded him to kill the ungrateful president. Knowing little about firearms, he borrowed $15.00 and purchased a 442 Webley British Bulldog revolver. Guiteau wanted one with ivory grips because it would look good as a museum exhibit after the assassination, but could not afford the extra dollar. President Garfield was shot that hot July morning by the self-proclaimed stalwart of the stalwarts. Garfield would have survived had the doctors not inserted their unsterilized fingers into the wound probing for the bullet. This caused infection and blood poisoning, for which at the time there were no antibiotics. President Garfield died at 10.35 p.m. on Monday, September 19, 1881, having lingered bedridden with fevers, extreme pain, and bronchial pneumonia. Not an assassination orchestrated by the Rothschild, Rockefeller, and Morgan interests, but one that no less benefited them. 
Chester A. Arthur became president and offered Roscoe Conkling an appointment to the U.S. Supreme Court, although it was thought the gesture was merely complimentary. That Conkling was too partisan to make a good justice, and that Arthur was paying back his patron with the honor of nomination. In fact, Conkling and Arthur were so intimately associated that it was feared after President Garfield was assassinated that the killing had been done at Conkling's behest in order to install Arthur as president. On March 13th, 1881, Tsar Alexander II was assassinated. Nikolai Rysakov, a young member of the People's Will Movement, exploded a bomb under the Tsar's carriage. The bomb didn't kill the Tsar, but a second tossed by another young member of the movement, Ignasi Hirnowicki, sealed the Tsar's fate. The assassination caused a great setback for the Russian reform movement. Alexander II drafted plans for an elected parliament, or Duma, which were completed the day before he died, but not yet released to the Russian people. Had he lived, Russia might have followed a path to constitutional monarchy instead of the long road of oppression that defined his successor's reign. The first action Alexander III took after his coronation was to tear up those plans. A parliament would not come into fruition until 1905, when Alexander II's grandson, Nicholas II, commissioned the Duma, following extreme pressure on the monarchy as a result of the Russian Revolution of 1905. A second consequence of the assassination was anti-Jewish legislation. A third consequence of the assassination was that suppression of civil liberties in Russia and police brutality burst back in full force after experiencing some restraint under the reign of Alexander II. Alexander II's murder was witnessed firsthand by his son, Alexander III, and his grandson, Nicholas II. Both future Tsars arrested protesters and uprooted suspected rebel groups, creating further suppression of personal freedom for the Russian people. On the night of July 16, 1918, Tsar Nicholas II and his entire family were slaughtered by the Bolsheviks, all executed in the same room, even though they had already abdicated power on March 15, 1917. The family was murdered at the orders of the Rothschilds, who, along with the Rockefellers and the J.P. Morgan Banks, had great influence over the Bolsheviks having supplied them with loans to finance the February 1917 revolution. This was done not only to gain control of the country of Russia, but as a long-remembered act of revenge against Tsar Alexander II, who sided with President Lincoln in 1864, and his father, Tsar Alexander I, who blocked the Rothschilds' plan for world government in 1815 at the Congress of Vienna, which was later used as the model for the League of Nations and the United Nations. My fellow citizens, recent events have imposed upon the patriotic people of this country the responsibility of duty greater than that of any since the Civil War. Then it was a struggle to preserve the government of the United States. Now it is a struggle to preserve the financial honor of the government. We are Change with host Howard Dima, exposing the collectivist global elite's Malthusian quest for a new world order. A one world dictatorial government where all aspects of human life are under their control. Truth Talk Radio, where news the mainstream media ignores is the top story and your voice is heard. Every Friday, 1 to 3 p.m. and every Saturday, 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's We Are Changed with Howard Nemo. Fridays, 1 to 3 p.m. and Saturdays, 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Only on InformedRadio.com.